Good morning, my name is Pastor Jeremy Shines and this is I Am Loved Church. Let's pray, Father, bless this word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness, your sovereignty, your holiness. Speak to our minds and our hearts, refresh our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're gonna cover verse 15 through 35. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 35. There's going to be two sections here. The first one's called Restoring a Brother or Sister. The second one's called The Parable of the Unforgiving Servant. Now, by the way, the Bible wasn't written with Bible verses when it was first scribed. So, when we see these verses and everything, that's the way what we're used to. But in actuality, they weren't there weren't any Bible verses, right? There were just letters that were accumulated, and we found that they were this was written by this person, so they were consolidated, and that's where we get the different books of the Bible. So what I, I say all that to say this. This is one huge section, okay? Technically speaking, this is one huge section. They're not actually broken up in two. They're actually one huge section. And I was studying this and I was like, this doesn't really make any sense unless you bring in the whole piece. Okay. By the way, this is going to be a long sermon, but it's going to be a very needed and a very powerful sermon. Okay. This is going to be a long sermon, but it's going to be very needed and it's going to be very powerful. All right. I haven't preached like this in a while or actually really ever. And so God has some things that he wants to say. All right. And so with that being said, uh, let's get right to it. So the first section is restoring a brother or a sister. And so this is referring to people who are believers. All right. But I also think it's also referring to unbelievers, but we're really just going to cover the believer aspect of this. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 20. That's the first section. If your brother sins against you or sister, go and rebuke, which means correct him or her in private. If they listen to you, you have won your brother or sister. But if they don't listen Take another person with you so that by the testimony of two people or three people, every fact or word will be established. If they don't pay attention to them either, tell the church. And if they don't pay attention to even the church, let him be like or her be like a Gentile or a tax collector to you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you prayed for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For whatever, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Let's pray. Lord, bless your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your righteousness. Holy Spirit, illuminate the word of God. Jesus, help us. Wash us and cleanse us and teach us what you want us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, this is a whole section, but we're just going to break down this section, and then we're going to bring in the next section, and then we're going to look at it bird's eye over the whole thing, okay? So with that being said, let's break this down. So this is referring to in the kingdom of God, okay? People who have accepted Christ, who claim to be Christians, who are followers of Jesus. This is referring to those folks, okay? Mainly, we're going to cover. If someone sins against you, go and correct that person in private. So what does that look like? I'm going to tell you of an incident that I don't like talking about, but I, it's a great example of what this looks like. So long story short, I, I, I went into, for example, a public place, right? And I was accused of something. I'm not going to get into specifics. I was accused of something, right? And I had no idea that I was doing that, or at least that's the way the person was interpreting me. And... 
it is like it got out of hand, right? That person, what they should have done, they should have come to me in private and say, hey, when you do this, it makes me feel like this. And I'm like, oh, right? That's what it should have happened. I'm sorry, I won't do that if that's what offends you. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, whatever offends my brother. So this has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the other person. Hear me out? This happens in my marriage all the time. I do things all the time that I don't realize that I'm doing that's offending my spouse, right? Or even my kids, right? Or anyone. It's someone else. It's, it's what's going on with that other person. Not necessarily what's going on with me, but hey, they're offended by my actions. Now, for example, they, they interpret me doing this thing, whatever that is. I'm not doing that thing to offend them. Matter of fact, I don't even know they're there. I don't even know what they're perceiving or how they're perceiving me. Okay? So they're, I'm offended by what you're doing. Right? So what they, for example, need to do is come to me and tell me in private, hey, uh, this offends me. And then we have a discussion. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not doing that to hurt you. This is just what I do on a regular basis, for example. So we don't know how people are perceiving us, in other words. But the Apostle Paul says, if I eat meat and it's offending this person, and I like meat, and meat is technically not even a sin, right? But I like it, and it's offending this person. I don't want this person to be offended, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to eat meat anymore so I don't offend my brother. Now, that's kind of extreme, right? Because meat is not a sin. There's so many things that are not sinful, right? Someone comes up to me and be like, hey, Jeremy, I don't like your skin color. I'm like, I can't change that, can I? <laughs> right? And what Paul is not saying, like, some extreme, like, change your skin color if someone says i'm offended by your skin color that's not what he's talking about there's things that you can't change but he's what he's saying is hey if eating meat around you offends you i'm not going to eat meat around you i'm going to be aware of your feelings and hear me out those are things that i can change right i don't have to eat meat around you right some people are like hey i don't like cigarettes can you please stop smoking cigarettes okay I'll smoke cigarettes away from you. Or I'll smoke cigarettes, right, when you're not around. Because that offends you. That's something that we can change. But we can't change everything that everyone's offended about, can we? Absolutely not. Especially when it comes to the truth, the word of God. We're not ex expected to change. God's ex not expected to change because we are offended because we want to go and sin. And he's holy and he says, can you stop doing that, please? And so there's a huge difference. We must identify what you can change and what you cannot change. You can't change your skin color. You can't change uh, certain things about yourself. You just have to accept that, right? But there's other things we can change. And what he's talking about here is he's saying your relationship with that person. So this is talking about believers, right? He says if you have an issue with a person that you have a relationship with, Hear me out? I don't think this is necessarily talking about it's every single person, right? Because that's impossible. You know, there's a study that says you only meet about 100,000 people throughout your entire lifetime. And you actually really only know a few thousand of those people, like two or 3,000 or maybe even 10. I don't know that you actually do know. And then less than that, that you actually have a personal relationship with. Do you hear what I'm saying? So it's really impossible to live up to all those expectations. It's impossible, right? We're not expected to. So he's talking about brotherly and sisterly love within the local congregation, within the local group or so, circ your circle of people that claim to be believers. Amen? That's what he's talking about. You can keep track of that, right? Oh, man, when I do this, this person doesn't like it. So I'll either do it when they're not around, right? I'll do it. When they're not looking, it's not sinful, by the way. It's just things that that's offending that person, right? Being cautious and aware of other people's feelings. That's what he's talking about here. If that person has an offense towards you, they need to come tell you, right? They need to come and tell you. 
I'll give you an example. My wife doesn't like going to the doctor, right? Just the way they ask questions and all this other stuff, right? And I'm like, oh, because, you know, our daughter needed to go to the doctor yesterday. So she ended up just not liking that. And, and I was like, oh, okay. So I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> and, and long story short, she's like, I don't want to be the only one. And I'm like, okay. I don't want to be the only one. I'm like, okay. Why don't you do it? And I'm like, why don't you just ask? <laughs> right? Because she thinks I'm going to get offended, right? And I'm like, no, just ask me. Just come to me and ask me what you need. I'll do it. And that's what I did. I went over there, took the, our baby girl to the doctor's. Everything's fine, by the way. And uh, that was it. It was, it was this, this huge thing, this small thing that turned into this huge thing. When I, in actuality, the person just had to come and clarify with me, right? How many issues in life would be avoided if we just went to that person? Right? Not everyone has the maturity to, to receive correction, by the way. So be cautious, use wisdom, discernment, right? But you got to give them the benefit of the doubt. You've got to at least try, right? Because you can't always assume. That's where, that's where the devil gets in, our flesh, the devil, the world, right? All this assumption, and then with the assumption comes all the gossip, right? When all we had to do was go to that person and say, hey, is this what you're doing because you're trying to hurt me or or this is the way I'm interpreting this behavior or this is the way I interpreted what you said about this, right? Is this true? Most of the time I have found when I went to someone and said, hey, did you do this or because of this or this or this? Most of the time, about 95, 99% of the time, right? They have said, no, no, you misinterpret, you misunderstand like the Pharisees, right? trying to interpret Jesus. You misinterpret, you misunderstand, no. So many people like at the Bible and they misunderstand, they misinterpret God's heart. So many issues would be avoided if we just simply go to the person and ask them why they're doing that politely, right? Not critically, why are you doing that? Why did you do that, right? But like, I'm curious, um, so you said this or you did this, I was curious, so the way I received it is this, is that true? Um, you know, and they, most of the time they'll be like, no, <laughs> no, I didn't do that because of, I was trying to hurt your feelings or because of this or that. I, I'm doing what my own psychological issues or things in interpreting the reality around me, right? Most of the time you'll find out that your assumptions are false, right? We have so many issues in this world. And in this context, mostly because we're not willing to build that relationship with that person and go to them in private, go to them in private, go to them in private and say, why did you do that? <laughs> right? Without accusing them with an accusational question, why did you do that? They're like, I'm curious, um, you did this and I was curious why, right? Giving them the benefit of the doubt, giving them the benefit of the doubt giving them the benefit of the doubt, right? Giving, focusing on them and not yourself, right? You did this to me because you were trying to hurt me. Most of the time people assume, most of the time people assume, most of the time people assume, rather than going to the person in private and asking, I was curious why you did this. <laughs> oh, and then tell them how you interpreted or how you received that. We could avoid so many issues if just clearly going to the person in private. And say you have an issue with that person, that person doesn't listen as he talks here. He says, if you have talked to the person, the person says, oh, you got the clarification. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm totally sorry. I thought this, right? No. Oh, all right. great. It says, if they listen to you, you have won your brother or sister. Amen. Praise the Lord. But what happens if they don't listen to you? But if he or she won't listen, no, right? No, I didn't do that. And there's an argument and there's a dispute and there's an issue, right? Because most of the time what tends to happen is everyone is interpreting the world differently. You're going to walk out of this sermon. I have my agenda of what I want to say and how I want to say it and what I mean by it. You're going to walk out of this sermon and you're, most people are going to misinterpret why I preach this sermon. Totally going to get their own assumptions about why I said this and this and this and this, right? I'm sure you're already thinking about things that I've already said and you're like, what did he mean by that? 
you can just message me by the way and i'll tell you exactly what i meant by that. <laughs> right and so there's two people interpreting each other it's like two books right interpreting each other and usually when the book the two people or the two books are looking at each other one of them saying is i'm right and you're wrong and no one's listening if you're listening to see who's right and who's wrong rather than just listening to the other side right Hear me out? The, the, uh, the person named Tree is reading the book called Water. The book Water is reading the book called Tree. Right? You hear what I'm saying? And the, and the water is trying to understand what the tree is like. Um, you know, if water was a... It actually is a created being. But if water was like a human and it had an intellectual understanding and it would look at the book called tree and it would try to understand how the tree works right without putting itself onto the tree and saying oh that doesn't make any sense to me because i'm water i don't this is a terrible analogy but i'm gonna keep going and the tree would look at the book called water and and say well this doesn't make any sense to me we look at each other's lives and our lives don't make a, a, a sense to us but to ourselves, our lives make sense to ourselves. Hear me out? We're all looking at the world and interpreting the world and people's behavior differently. And so we need to go to them private and talk to each other, right? To get some clarification. But here's the thing. If, if, if disputes erupt in that private correction or trying to understand your brother or your sister, then guess what needs to happen? You need to bring somebody else so they can establish what's actually happening. Hey, 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 still stop arguing. Stop arguing. Okay. You guys are saying the same thing in your own words and you're misunderstanding one another's words. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> so let's just bring some clarification. Both of you are right. What? How could we both be right? You guys interpret things differently. But as I've been listening, you guys are saying the same thing <laughs> in your own way. Okay, great. But let's say there have, there's actual issues with one another, right? And, and, and one person is leaning more to this side and the other person leaning more to that side, right? One person's actually right and one person's actually wrong. Then that third person can look at it and be like, actually, this person's right and you're wrong. Or you're right and this person's wrong. Or heck, He's right about this, but you're wrong about this. Or she's right about this, but you're wrong about this. Like, like then they can bring clarity to that. And oh, okay. And then great. You've, you've come back to, you know, verse 15. You've won each other because the third person stepped in. So with that being said, who is the third person? The third person, he's talking about a physical person. Okay. Which we're going to cover who the other person is jesus but right technically but with that being said the third person should be unbiased to sides right technically it should be the pastor or an elder someone who is not best friends with either of those people because if you bring that if this person person a brings you know person a1 who's siding with them right then 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 Person A1 is the mediator. Person A1 is going to take person A's side. But if person B brings person B1, right? And B1 is the mediator between A and B. Then I guess who uh, the mediator is going to side with? Well, this person, obviously B. Because I'm B1 and I'm their friend and I don't know who you are. <laughs> so you have to be careful who the mediator is. But other aside from that, the greatest mediator is Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey. I'm watching the whole thing, which we're going to get to, right? So you find a person who's unbiased to both sides. You listen, maybe there's some conclusions being made and you want each other over after the third person steps in. What if there's not the person who's unbiased goes, no, actually you're wrong. And this person's right, right? And if the person changes their ways, gets corrected, okay, I, I, I screwed up then guess what? Everything goes on. But let's say, for example, worst case scenario, we got it. It's, as you notice, it's getting worse, right? 
Worst case scenario, the person says, no, I'm not wrong. Both of you are wrong. And right. Then it says, take it to the church. So now it's, it, it goes from private to two people involved to three people involved. And then eventually it goes on and on until everyone gets involved. And by that time that happens, now <laughs> the whole community is involved. And now people get to actually observe what's going on. Now you have more eyes. Now it's not just any biased, right? Because maybe there was some bias there. Now it's like everyone's involved to make a judgment. And in worst case scenario, if the church says, hey, no, we're siding with this particular person, right? And you're actually still wrong and the person still denies, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> it says, remove that person from the congregation. The apostle Paul says, there's this man sleeping with his mother-in-law, right? His father's wife. He has not repented. Get him out of the congregation lest he pollutes the congregation. Lest his action, because he's unrepentant towards that, he doesn't think he's sorry. He, Paul, so Paul says, even the unbelievers who saw that were like, really? It's even d disgusting to them. So get this guy out of here. Get him out of here because if he stays here, then everyone else is saying, if he's getting away with that, I guess I can just get away with this. We actually had an incident where a person was like, well, I'm just doing this and I do it, whatever, right? And other people are listening to that and they're like, well, if pastor's not correcting this person for this, then I guess I can do this, right? And it's like cancer, it spreads really quickly. One person's bad behavior spreads throughout the community, throughout the church and then into the community, right? But if pastor corrects this person, hey, no, we're not doing that. Then everyone else sees that person get corrected. And then they go, oh, snap. I do that, but I just didn't get caught for it. Or I was thinking about doing that. No, I know I'm not going to do that, right? Do you hear what I'm saying? And so Jesus wants to spread righteousness to the kingdom. Is it a sin? Is eating meat a sin? Technically, no. Right? So he's dealing with the matters of sin, not technically preferences. My brother or sister's preferences is they don't like me eating meat. It's not a sin to eat meat. But the apostle Paul is like, because I love you so much, I'm not going to eat meat because I don't want to offend you. That's not talking about this necessarily. It's talking about actual sin. Is it an actual sin what this person did against this person? Hear me out? So says, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell it to the church. If he doesn't pay attention to the church, let that person be like a Gentile or a tax collector to you. Amazing how this stuff goes. It goes from, it starts from a personal matter to a, a, a group of people matter to a church matter. And eventually it goes into the community and it goes even further than that, as we're going to cover. Verse 18, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Man, this gets misinterpreted so many times. Let me tell you the misinterpretation of this. Pull things down from heaven onto earth. Why don't you just say pray? Why didn't Jesus just say pray? He actually did, right? And our father in heaven, <laughs> prayer, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven he's not saying you know whatever you want just pull it out of heaven <laughs> right and so that's not what he's talking about here this is a, a matter of a dispute this whole context it's having an issue with one another right and and, and this is the same context truly i tell you whatever you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven and whatever you have not forgiven on earth, you will not be forgiven in heaven. Mind you, the second portion of this is dealing with the same issue. Hear me out. Doesn't this sound familiar? Jesus says it this way. If you don't forgive your brother, <laughs> you will not be forgiven. So this person, I have an issue with this person. They sinned against me. I'm going to tell them to their face. The brother says, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you. That matter's over now. I'm gonna try not to do that again. 
No, 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 no. I still don't believe you. No, 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 no. I'm still going to bring other people into this. <laughs> right? All right, you brought someone else. I said I was sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not satisfied with that. I'm going to bring the whole church into this. Okay, I'm sorry. The whole church watches it. Hey, you said we're sorry. Hey, he or she said they're not going to do it again. No, 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 no. <laughs> I want justice for this matter. This is what the verse continues, the chapter continues to say. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about any matter, right, that you pray for, it will be done for you, my Father in heaven. For whatever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus is saying, I'm there in the midst of all of the issues that you're having here on earth. Hear me out? I'm there. So if you both, two people forgive each other, I have forgiven both of you. If one person hasn't forgiven, I have not forgiven that unforgiving person. Hear me out? If this person actually repented and changed from what they're being accused of, I have forgiven that person. Why can't you forgive that person? Which is going to cover in the second portion. I don't like how the, the Bible, the modern day Bible has a lot of verses and it cuts out a lot of things and it separates things because it's like, it's actually one full picture. You're like, where does it say that? As, you con as we continue on to the second section, it's going to cover that, right? This is still the same dispute between two people. Hear me out. Let's get to it. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Verse 21 through 35. When Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? See how it's referring to this person sinned against me. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him in private. Go correct them in private. So this is a, so Jesus is talking to Peter here. <laughs> right? I tell you not as many as seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. I like how the chosen says it. Seven times seven. 70 times seven. Completion times completion. I've heard uh, commentaries actually say, for that particular sin, not for all the other sins, that particular sin, if they sin against you seven times 70, you have to forgive that particular sin. By the time you keep counting, you'll be like, bro, whatever. Like, I'm tired of counting. I forgive you. <laughs> I have to forgive you 70 times. It's like 144. Like, what? Like, oh my gosh, that's a lot. Or maybe more than that, actually. Like 400 or something. I don't know. I'm not a math professor. <laughs> For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, hum humans, right? When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, he his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. And th at this, the servant fell down face down before him and said, be patient with me. I will pay you everything. Then his master of that servant had compassion, released him and forgave him the loan. It's an impossible debt, by the way, to pay back. That servant went out, found one of his fellow servants or brothers and sisters in Christ who owed him a hundred denarii, literally like 15 bucks, some really cheap or a hundred dollars. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went out and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servant saw what had taken place they were deeply distressed and went and reported to the other master everything that had happened then after he had summoned him his master said to him you wicked servant i forgave you all that debt because you begged me shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as i had mercy on you 
And because he was angry, his master handed him over to a jailer's and to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgive his brother or sister from their heart. Let's pray. Lord, bless this word again. So much here in Jesus name. Amen. So you notice the second section has to deal with the first person. Who is the first person? The brother accusing this person who sinned against this person sinned against me, right? So the first section makes the makes that person look righteous, doesn't it? Right? Hey, this person sinned against me. Hey, this person sinned against you. Did you go and tell them in private? I told them in private. Did you bring two or three witnesses? I brought two or three witnesses. Did you tell the church? I told the church. Right? All right. Did the person say they were sorry? <laughs> yeah, they did. Right? But they, yeah, they did. They did say they were sorry. So what's the problem? I guess there isn't any, right? <laughs> That's the truth. But let's say the person didn't say they were sorry. No, they didn't say they were sorry to me. They didn't say they're sorry to, to, the, to the third party, right? Of, who were watching, observing. They didn't say they're sorry to the church. They didn't say they were sorry. Okay, okay, okay. They didn't say they were sorry. But wait a minute. How much has Jesus forgiven you? Jesus, Jesus forgave me of this and this, if we're honest, of a debt I can't never pay back. But this person sinned against you, right? Yes, yes, they did. Was it as bad as that or all those other things combined? No. So this whole section deals with, well, why can't you forgive that person then? For example, if Jesus forgave you of a trillion dollars, why can't you forgive this guy of a hundred? See how it all comes back around to the person who's accusing this brother of sinning, being sinning against this person? What would the church look like if they actually meditated on this, actually applied this for their own life on a regular basis? You know what I've come to find? Whatever you're holding against people, you will eventually do. You have already done, don't see it. Or you have sinned against God in a different way. And he has forgiven you of many things. But you can't forgive that person for that little thing. Quite interesting, isn't it? And so what this is the Bible says is if this person did sin against you, whether they did or didn't, has nothing to do with this whole entire passage. The, the real question is, how much have you been forgiven for? You've been forgiven for an impossible debt that you could never pay back. How could you hold anything against anybody? And this is what he says right here. Verse 33. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant, your fellow brother or sister in Christ, as I had mercy on you? Verse 34. And because he was angry, the master being, he handed that servant, that unforgiving servant, over to the jailers to be tortured. You know who the jailers are? The demons. He handed that unforgiving person over to the demons to be tortured. Whatever you have against people here on earth, whatever you bind on earth is going to be brought before the courts of heaven. Jesus is saying, hey, as it is in heaven, deal with it on earth so that way I don't have to deal with it in heaven. Do you have issues with people here on earth? There's another passage where Jesus says, hey, before you offer your gift at the altar, before you stand before my holy altar and worship me, do you know, do you know anyone who has anything against you? Go and be reconciled first before you come to me and worship me. 
clear your debt with that person first. If they receive you, you want your brother back or your sister back. If they still don't accept your apology, hey, you did your part. Now come and worship me. Make sure you, no one has anything against you before you come and worship me. Because in, it, as it is in heaven, it's going to be here on earth. As it is on earth, it's going to be in heaven. He's marrying the two concepts. People are waiting to die and worship God in heaven. They're, they need to die now <laughs> to, their, to their pride, to their unforgiveness, right? It perplexes me. Jesus says, to the least of these you have done, you have done it to me. He's going to judge us in heaven based off how we treated people here on earth. Now let's read that part again, right? Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you do on earth will be done in heaven, right? Whatever you don't do on earth will not be done for you in heaven. What? If you don't forgive one person or you don't forgive those people who sin against you, your heavenly father will not forgive you of your sins. If you bless people here on this earth, you will be blessed by your father in heaven. The scripture says this, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your earthly children, how much more will your father do for you? How you treat people here on earth is how God will treat you. That's what this whole thing is talking about. Whatever you bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. That is basically saying how you treat people here is how you'll be treated in heaven. The whole Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are merciful. If you're merciful to people here, God will be merciful to you in heaven or from heaven, right? If you are unmerciful to people here, God will be unmerciful to you. If you are unforgiving to people here, God will be unforgiving to you. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I was like, what does this mean? Because it doesn't mean pulling things down from heaven, right? It means whatever you do here will be done in heaven, whether good or bad. To the least of these you've done, to anyone you've treated here on earth, I'll weigh that against you. How many of us have a lot of things to say we're sorry about for people? Hey, if, I, if eating meat offends this person, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because I don't want God to hold anything against me. Did you know that people are in jail, in spiritual jail? Because they have sinned against someone. If they sinned against someone, they've sinned against him, right? Instead of reconciling with that person, they're being tormented by demons. God sent those demons to torment you. Right? Every time you think of that person, you, I can't stand that person. You know why? Those are demons. You can't stand that person because you have unforgiveness towards that person. Or you haven't asked for forgiveness from that person. For example, somebody sins against me, whether unintentionally or intentionally. They complain to God. God, they did this to me. If God sides with that person, because not every accusation that people bring against you, right, God will side with, all right? But if God does say, hey, you know, I agree with that. They did do that against you. Guess what God does? He sends the demons to torment you. Now you have tormentive thoughts. Ah! Right? You're being tormented by demons because God sided with that person's judgment about you. But God also sends tor demons towards them too to until they forgive you. Isn't that crazy? So go to that person. Oh, I'm so sorry. The demons are attacking me. I'm so sorry. I, God said I, you have something against me and he's siding with you. I'm so sorry. The demons fall off of you but they're still being tormented because they don't want to forgive you. Isn't that crazy? But God doesn't always side with those people. I've had people accuse me of many things, took it before the Lord. Hey, Lord, they did this to me. Jeremy did this to me. And God's like, you're wrong. <laughs> 
I'm not sending demons to attack him because he didn't do anything wrong, right? Amen. So the accusation has to be actually righteous in the eyes of God. I've had to go to people that God says, hey, you did this against them. I'm siding with their judgment against you. So go to that person and say you're sorry so I can clear your record. And I did. Right? I don't want anyone or anything to get in the way between me and my heavenly father. And the more you get used to saying, I'm sorry, the easier it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And be honest and be real. I'm so sorry. Don't defend yourself. Just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. <laughs> and go about and then worship. And then you have peace and joy. Now you never have to think about that person ever again. Unless they come around again, right? Not every accusation that people bring against you will be held against you. Only what God sees and agrees with those accusations. Yeah, that, that I can, yeah, he actually did try to hurt you. Yeah, I'll hold to that against him. And then in tormented, ah, what is this? <laughs> I told you you're going to want to listen to this sermon. That's because God's like, that's because you sinned against that person. And I agree with their judgment against you. So go to them and say you're sorry. Boom, now I cleared you of the debt. But Lord, this person still hasn't forgiven me. I've also sent them tormentors as well. As we read here, let's read this whole section again. All right? Verse 29. At this, his fellow servant fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison that he could pay what was owed. Verse 31. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed. And went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, his, then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt. <laughs> and you begged me. You should forgive this person. Right? But you did not have mercy as I had mercy on you. And so he sent them to spiritual jail to be tortured. It's crazy. We, you know, we see people acting out in whatever demonic way, fleshly way. That's the torment of God. That's what Romans talks about. They're being tortured because of unforgiveness or unrepentant. It's not just okay. God doesn't just want us to ask for forgiveness from him. Let me say that again. God doesn't just want us to ask for forgiveness to what we've done to people from him. Because if we sin against them, we sin against him primarily, right? But God wants us to ask those people for forgiveness as well, regardless of how they respond. Hear me out? So if you can't forgive this person and this person and this person in your local community, in your local church... It doesn't matter what other church you're going to go to, where you move, you're going to find the same issue because it's you. You're going to bring your problems over there and they're going to address the same thing. And if you don't deal with it there, then they're going to, you're, you're going to deal with it over here. And if until you repent or until you forgive or both what you've done or what people have done to you, you're going to find that issue everywhere you go because it's you. And so it perplexes me that in the end, the Lord showed me, Jesus showed me, you're all forgiven in the end, in the very end. You're not just forgiven by God, but you are forgiving towards everyone until you complete the righteousness of God by forgiving everyone who sinned against you. Right? Once you realize how much he's forgiven you, how could you not forgive everybody? And so the reason why we have people not in church <laughs> is because people don't think they did anything wrong. <laughs> and they don't want to not just ask for forgiveness from him for what they did to others or forgive those who sinned against them. 
They don't want to go and be reconciled to those people and say they're sorry to them. Your sorry to someone could heal them. Matter of fact, your sorry to that person can heal not just them, but their whole family. Amen? And their family, and their families, which is another whole generation. That's why Jesus says, I say not to you seven times, but 77 times. He reverses the curse of Lamech in the book of Genesis. I think it's chapter four or five. If Cain sinned against this person this time, then seven times seven, right? Jesus reverses that curse. Isn't that wonderful? So when we look at the world, we're going to end here. We're going to, this is the bird's eye perspective, I promise you. I don't always do this. I don't always complete my promises, right? God forgive me. When you look at all of human history, but when you look at today, and you have all these accusations flying everywhere, you see it. You see it on the news. You see it in church. You see it in your local community. You see it in your house. You see it everywhere. You see all these accusations flying everywhere, gossips and so forth, right? You know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of us. It's a picture of unforgiveness. It's a picture of unrepentance. It's a picture of not going to one another in private and telling each other's faults and saying, hey, can you forgive me? Hey, can you stop doing this to me? But it's also a picture of, hey, unforgiveness. It's a picture of lack of mercy. It's a picture of self-righteousness. Right? You think about all the issues we have in all of humanity. It's a lack of mercy. Because what sits on, what sits above the Ark of Covenant? In the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments. It's the law. What's above it? The mercy seat. That in the end, everyone's going to be forgiven. And the fact that we don't want to, if God forgave man of all his sin, of all your sin, he forgave you of every sin that you would ever commit. Every sin you would commit today, every thought you would commit, everything. He had mercy on you for everything. And when you come to realize that you are guilty of every trespass, how could you, how could I not forgive those people of the same trespass you and I were forgiven of? God's like, I'm not holding any sin against any of you. Obviously against the other believers because they haven't repented. And obviously against brothers and sisters in Christ because they what? <laughs> haven't repented either. If, I, if God's like, I'm not holding anything against any of you guys. Why are you holding things against one another? If God is the greatest example, then why are we holding anything against one another? We killed them. We crucified them. The most brutal thing that could be done to a human being. We put all our, all our sin was put on him. Every sin that existed. And he says, forgiven. If we're forgiven of all that, how, how could we hold anything against one another? And here's the crazy part. If you do, God will judge you. And you will do the same thing that you're holding against those people. I know I've done it. I've lived it. It happened to me. This is what the scripture says. It ends in 35, verse 35. It says, so also my heavenly father would do to you the same thing that you hold against others. He will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Whatever you're holding against people, God's going to do to you. I don't like them because they gossiped. You 
are going to be tormented. You are going to end up doing the same thing. You are already doing the same thing. You are guilty just as they are. We got people that don't want to hang out with people. We got people that don't want to be loving and kind towards people. You know what that's a picture of? Isolating themselves in their house, isolating themselves from community, not even going to church anymore. You know what that's a picture of? Self-righteousness. It's a picture of unforgiveness. I would never do that, you say. You do it every day. You and I do it every day. You're alone. You'll be alone with that mindset. Unless you repent, unless you forgive. I have something against you. <laughs> God says, I have nothing against you. The only thing that God has against us is not to believe his son. Anyone who does not believe in my son will be guilty of every trespass since the fall of Adam, since, since Cain and Abel, right? Every sin that's ever occurred, unless you repent, unless you go, I am guilty. I am guilty. I'm the guilty one. We're all guilty. The question is, are we humble enough to recognize it, to realize it and say, Lord, forgive me. And then once we're done doing that, go to that person and say, please forgive me. Once you realize how great of a debt he forgave you, how great of a debt he forgave you, you will not withhold forgiveness from anyone. Amen. That's all I got for you. My name is Pastor Jeremy Shines. This is I am loved and so are you. Let's pray. Father, bless this word. Thank you for this word. Thank you for us. Father, help us not be tormented. Help us repent. Help us go to those people and say we're sorry, regardless if they accept that apology or not. Help us get right with you so we can offer our gift as a living sacrifice, Jesus. We thank you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless.